Well, thanks, uh, Peter, for, for this uh, <clears throat> embarrassingly wonderful introduction. Um, I'm, I have to say that, uh, I, let, me, let me begin by saying what I will not be talking about. Uh, so I will not be talking about Badiou all that much, uh, simply because, uh, well, it is very tempting to do that. Uh, some of it is, you know, available uh, in English and written up. Uh, I will touch upon that. Um, so, um, but I will try to refrain from from uh, getting off on a, on a what for me is, uh, you know, quite possibly a, uh, a very interesting but uh, quite possibly infinite tangent. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to not do that. Um, uh, although, I mean, as as Per mentioned, uh, I, I did. I have spent a, a, a few of the recent years uh, trying to sort of locate, uh, you know, the importance of mathematics in Badiou's work. I mean, we all know it's, it's sort of central in some sense, so I was trying to figure out just in what sense and what exactly uh, he needs and what he's trying to do. Um, so that was, uh, you know, several years of, uh, 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 well, a combination of, of uh, Perplexion and uh, a mom interspersed with moments of, of just sort of joy and trying to figure something out. Also interspersed with moments of joy, such as collaboration with uh, uh, David Al Bahari and uh, and uh, Buxa and Mama in uh, in uh, creating this uh, wonderful edition that of, uh, of of a sort of response to uh, Badiou's uh, book on. Uh, uh, metaphysics of, of real happiness, which uh, is, is a Serbian writer who uh, uh, responds to the 21 thesis on, on, on happiness that Badiou uh, writes um, in the form of 21 very short stories, and then Perry invited me to sort of uh, uh, comment on both in some sense, and uh, it, it's just a wonderful addition. So, I mean, the, such moments are certainly uh, moments of, of pleasure and not of uh, perplexion. But enough of that. Um, what I would try to do today uh, is um, um, perhaps start off by giving a, a, what uh, appears to me to, to be possibly a kind of alternative history of structuralism from a mathematical point of view, and I'll try to bring the, you know, the, the two together in some sense, the, 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 the structuralism in the sense of you know, how is it understood uh, by, by uh, people in mathematics, um, and then structuralism as it is uh, generally sort of um, understood uh, you know, coming out of Saussure. Uh, and then, you know, coming together in this uh, in, in a certain moment in in history, and try to understand why uh, there is this coming together. Uh, but I'll try to keep it light. There won't be any formulas or anything. Uh, I, I understand there was uh, there was a long uh, late night uh, with uh, possibly some hangovers. So, uh, so um, <clears throat> I'll keep it there. Uh, so we'll start from there, and I'll just try to see where 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 my thought evolves from there. So let me let me begin by by saying that um, essentially. Um, a structuralist idea, uh, or at least some sort of proto-structuralist idea, does uh, uh, start showing up in mathematics uh, sometime in the 19th century, and then it kind of, uh, you know, it's it's not really uh, officially formulated, but you can find very important traces of it in, and I'll give you quotes from three, um, basically, um, um, crucial mathematicians of of of, uh, of the 20th century. Um, who essentially formulate some of the ideas that I think uh, very much relate to structuralism. So let me start with uh, um, uh, Poincaré, uh, who says, uh, mathematicians do not study objects but relations among objects. To them it is a matter of indifference if these objects are replaced by others as long as relations among them remain the same. So in other words, it is really not uh, about uh, uh, you know, the signified, as, as it were. I mean, there is there is this arbitrary relation. I mean, really, uh, f from a mathematical point of view, we are looking at structures of things. Um, so that's that's Poincaré. Uh, so Poincaré uh, would have uh, said that in one of his popular books. Uh, so that's that's uh, you know possibly 1902-35, um, uh, one of his popular books on uh, on science. Um, he wasn't the only one. Uh, perhaps the most famous uh, uh, mathematical formulation, although uh, some, somewhat uh, apocryphal, um, is uh, another uh, one from uh, David Hilbert, a German mathematician, also a, a crucial figure in 20th century math, who says, well, we must always be ready to replace points, lines, and planes with chairs, tables, beer mugs. So there is this arbitrary relation. Again, we're just looking at structural relations. I mean, the, the, the actual sort of objects there are, are, are not, of, not of interest. And then there is Hermann Weil, who is a very interesting figure 
uh, not only mathematically but also philosophically because he had strong interest in ph phenomenology um, and was, was for a while writing, uh, you know, in the 1920s papers that were uh, sort of um, very beautiful and strange mixture of philosophy and mathematics. Uh, so he's quite, quite, a, quite an important person. And he says, well, the idea of isomorphism uh, of structures, uh, that's implicit, demarcates the self-evident insurmountable boundary of cognition. In other words, you can't really go beyond looking at things structurally. I mean, the, the, the nature of elements, uh, whichever, whatever it is that you do, ultimately uh, there'll be some structure in there and you can't go back beyond that. Um, and isomorphism is just a technical term. Uh, you can ignore it, but essentially it means, I mean, as the word says, I mean, it means that the structures are sort of the same. Um, so if they're structurally the same, that's about it. I mean, you, you can't go beyond that. Um, so these are, these are so, uh, key um, uh, pre-structuralist moments uh, in, in, um, from a mathematical point of view. All of this occurs uh, really around the turn of the 20th century, so early in the 20th century. Um, and so this is also roughly the time when, when Saussure gives his course, let's say, the, 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 I guess that's 1912-13, uh, uh, the, the course on general linguistics, right? Uh, so it's, it's, we're talking about a sort of zeitgeist here that, uh, that you know, I'm not trying to claim some sort of priority for, for mathematics or anything like that. I'm just simply saying, you know, that things were out there and uh, they took shape in a certain way. Um, so, uh, but uh, all of this is sort of sporadic. I mean, this, uh, you know, Poincaré, Hilbert, and Weil are hugely influential in, 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 in mathematics. Uh, so when they say something, I mean, people tend to listen. But nevertheless, the, the concept of a sort of structure as a, as a, as a basic kind of um, um, subject of mathematics um, um, uh, doesn't get that status until a little bit later. And it's interesting how it gets that status. So let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so there is this figure of uh, Nicolas Bourbaki, um, who uh, uh, the most interesting thing about Bourbaki is that there is this huge discrepancy uh, between the uh, influence exerted by Bourbaki and the fact that Bourbaki doesn't exist, never did. Uh, Bourbaki is, is a fictional character, it, it's a group of French mathematicians that decided to uh, operate under a, a pen name of Nicolas Bourbaki and they uh, undertook this um, uh, uh, monumental project of, uh, you know, with, with clear ambitions uh, to write up uh, what was to be, um, you know, Euclid's elements for all of mathematics. Um, and so there is like this incredible number of volumes called Elements of Mathematics that uh, Bubaki produced. Um, it, quite clearly, I mean, even in the title, Elements of Mathematics, they were referring back to, to Euclid, uh, trying to set up the, the sort of current state of knowledge and, you know, the way, the way things should be done in math. Now, um, so uh, this comes from a 1948 uh, paper uh, translated in, into English in 1950 called The Architecture of Mathematics. Uh, where um, and and this is a sort of um, a, a, a manifesto a posteriori of, of structuralism in mathematics because this paper appears after something like ten volumes of this monumental project of elements have already been showing up in in, in, in France. Um, so, but you know, at that point they decide to sort of export it, uh, you know, publish in English, uh, redefine the, the project in, in, in this particular form. So. Uh, for them, mathematics appears as a storehouse of abstract forms, mathematical structures. Uh, this part I'm quoting here, but we'll come back to it uh, later. Um, the second bullet point here is of some interest because it says, um, and it so happens, without our knowing why, and we'll have to return to that, that certain aspects of empirical reality fit themselves into these forms as if through a kind of pre-adaptation. Um, and we'll just leave it at that. Uh, okay. Uh, philosophy, then Bourbaki claims, expends great efforts to explain this, but we're not going to do that. We are not interested in philosophy. That is, Bourbaki is not interested in philosophy. Bourbaki thereby creates this fictional, mythical figure of a working mathematician 
a working mathematician is somebody who just does math and has no philosophical interest. Um, you know, they'll be you know not really engaged with any kind of philosophical. It's it's a defense mechanism for Bubaki to say, well, you know, don't ask us philosophical questions. We we can't really answer them. So we're just working mathematicians. But really, uh, you know, that's kind of disingenuous because meanwhile they're creating this huge project that that aims to redefine mathematics so I mean they they're they're shirking philosophical responsibility in this sense but we'll see that they, they can't really resist and they do something in there that that's kind of interesting Can I just um, ask, the Burbaki volumes are translated into English oh yes yes uh, yes yes no Burbaki is uh, yeah I mean it's 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 sort of a standard and uh, it's become such a standard that people at one point started considering it a problem because it's like, you know, enough for Bucky. I mean, there's, there's, there's got to be other, <laughs> other ways of thinking about these things. But yes, definitely, it's, uh, it's in English. And um, okay, so um, Bourbaki uh, sets out with, uh, with this quite open, huge ambition to, uh, you know, redefine mathematics and how mathematics should be done. And it, it, it is influential. Um, it's influential because well, uh, it's an influential group of, of mathematicians in, in France. Uh, it is a post-war era. Um, there is a, a sort of French uh, um, absurgence in, in, in sciences uh, created uh, partly in response to what they felt was a sort of a upper hand that the German sciences had. Um, and um, you know, there is there is pressure on the educational systems, and not only in France, but throughout the, the, the Western world, to sort of adopt this view of, of, of Bourbaki. Um, partly, this is uh, successful because there was a commission by uh, United Nations into which Bourbaki inserted uh, uh, one of its members uh, that then influenced uh, the, the, the reform of mathematical education that became known in uh, North America as the New Math. In, uh, in uh, Europe, it, it was known as modern mathematics. Um, and basically, everyone uh, went through that. We started doing set theory in school uh, at some point. Uh, well, everyone except Soviet Union. They didn't. Um, so that's an interesting political question, but uh, probably not for today. Um, so influence grows, and not only in the sciences in mathematics education, uh, but also in the humanities. I mean, there is a famous moment of collaboration of uh, André Vey with, uh, with Lévi-Strauss on uh, the elementary structures of kinship, where there is some sort of mathematical uh, analysis of, of, uh, of the, the kinship relations. Uh, and so, of course, uh, André Veil is, is uh, the brother of, of Simone Veil, and, and that's uh, you know, another sort of uh, important connection in French intellectual circles. Uh, so structuralism à la Bourbaki then becomes a kind of paradigm of, of scientific rationality in some sense. Um, now, it's not to say that you know, everyone was starting, starting to read Bourbaki uh, everywhere, but we will see that uh, it, it does have an effect uh, that is not uh, sporadic. Another important thing, I mean, this is just a tangential remark, uh, but Jean Piaget, who again was an influential uh, psychologist, uh, actually referred to Bourbaki and the uh, learning of structures and, uh, you know, actually put that in his uh, um, books on develop developmental psychology, which then sort of uh, reinforced this, this idea that uh, structuralism a la Bourbaki is, is the thing. So um, <clears throat> influence is there. Um, and um, also felt in, in the sort of field of structuralism, as I would assume is, 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 is familiar in, in, in the humanities. And um, so let me just uh, uh, display this quote from, uh, so there's this wonderful effort, uh, as, as, as many of Peter Howard's efforts are, uh, to uh, establish an online database of uh, Cahiers pour analyse, uh, which is a journal uh, that appeared for a short period in, 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 in France. Um, that um, here is from the introduction uh, to the web page. It says uh, uh, it um, uh, collected a group of uh, philosophers uh, guided by the example of Althusser and, and, and Lacan. They sought to combine structuralism and psychoanalysis with logical and mathematical formalization. And when you look at uh, you know, what, the, what the published papers are in, in, in uh, Cape Analyse, you see George Bull of Boolean logic fame, uh, you see Gerhard Cantor, you know, the inventor of set theory, 
Bertrand Russell, uh, Kurt Gödel, the famous logician of, of incompleteness theorems. And then alongside of these basically logicians, uh, you see Althusser, Lacan, Lévi-Strauss, Foucault, Derrida, Badiou. Uh, so this is a moment uh, of, 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 um, of an encounter between these traditions that uh, um, is, is very important uh, in, in the history of, of, of um, um, well, philosophy, um, I, I think. Um, and it was also more unfortunately also important in the way that it sort of uh, um, pretty soon faded out um, now so let me try to, to, to um, at least explain uh, what my view is of why why this uh, particular confluence occurred at this particular time um, So keeping in mind the context of, of Bourbaki's growing influence and this kind of structuralist approach to mathematics, uh, um, uh, whatever uh, that really means for Bourbaki, uh, at least it means that the word structure becomes super prominent. I mean, it's everywhere. The, you know, mathematics is all about structures. Uh, there are three basic types of structures, the algebraic structures, the order structures, the topological structures. So that's the kind of the, the general overview. Now, uh, at the same time, we're dealing with, with the 60s, and there is a, uh, there is a need, particularly um, in, in, in Western Marxist uh, uh, thought, to kind of dissociate itself from, from the sort of paradigm of scientific Marxism as practiced in, in Soviet Union, which is this kind of, you know, clockwork universe, mechanical Marxism. Uh, which Terry Eagleton describes in the, in, the, in, the, in the most hilarious way as he does as a uh, kettles boil classes struggle. So that's, uh, you know, that you really want to get out of that kind of deterministic mechanical view of, uh, you know, there is this teleology and, uh, you know, classes will struggle and then as, as though in some kind of a, uh, a mechanism, uh, you know, the uh, working classes will win and we will then uh, proceed to a classless society. I mean, it's, uh, uh, you know, a caricature of it, but uh, nevertheless, it, it becomes important uh, in particular with the, with the, with the still uh, strong presence of the existentialist, uh, you know, um, thought in, in, in France uh, to somehow reconcile, um, you know, the idea of, 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 uh, of a possibility of a meaningful sort of action um, um, a possibility of revolutionary agency, as it were, that is uh, not uh, some kind of mechanical consequence of you know the way the you know initial conditions of the world had been set, um, and so uh, in this respect, um, it becomes uh, very important. And it, I, I don't think I'm alone in this view, but at least uh, you know I, I, I do believe it. Uh, it. It becomes important to try to reconfigure this sort of paradigm of you know what it means to to have a sort of scientific approach to philosophy, such as, for example, Althusser, or perhaps some others were were uh, hoping, um, uh, especially the group uh, that that you can see sort of um, 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 floating around this Cahier uh, analysis. And so set theory, mathematics, uh, becomes, uh, in a sense, a paradigm of, of, uh, of, of this type of scientific rationality that doesn't uh, really lead to, to this super deterministic uh, mechanical way of, of things. Because there is really no uh, causality among sets. I mean, there's this set and there's this set. Um, you know, that there is no causal relation be between them. So you can think rationally about, about things uh, without necessarily implying some kind of um, 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 deterministic relation or causal relation. Um, there are also other problems um, in that uh, there is a problem that structuralism as practiced initially by Althusser was also really quite rigid. I mean, it was, you know, not the sort of, you know, deterministic mechanical view, but it was, it was very rigid and didn't really leave room for, you know, uh, what uh, would become uh, uh, referred to, or what would be referred to as the event. And now, the event, uh, which is something that sort of transcends structure and, and uh, you know, predictability of, of, of some kind of a, you know, a formal ordering, um, uh, obviously occurs in 1968 in Paris and becomes a huge problem for, for uh, you know, this sort of, um, you know, structuralist view, particularly for Althusser. Uh, 
because you know here you know you're talking about uh, uh, you know predetermined structures. In some sense, you got rid of the mechanical Marxism, perhaps. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, you have this thing erupted in the streets that uh, you know wasn't really predicted in any way, um, and so it becomes uh, it becomes a bit of a problem. Um, and and requires some sort of thinking beyond structure, if if you know if, if that is conceivable. And so you can see that uh, some of the some of the thinkers uh, on this list uh, did in fact uh, you know go in that direction. I just want to, and I will try to limit my um, my um, tangent on this. Uh, one one uh, character that doesn't appear on this list, but I think is is is, is very relevant, uh, is Cornelius Castoriadis. Uh, you know, whose uh, um, political random walks are subject of, you know, pro could be a subject of a novel. I mean, he started, as, you know, as a member of the Communist Party, then he left that, became a Trotskyist, then he left that, uh, you know, ultimately ended up being this sort of major crit uh, critic of, of Marxism. But what was the basis of his critique, uh, among other things, is uh, that uh, he, you know, he, he in this book, uh, which I think is very important for various reasons, um, called the Imaginary Institution of Society, um, he uh, criticizes this sort of um, uh, materialism as it is uh, typically presented in at that time, uh, uh, Marxist and in particular Maoist um, uh, writings. So he says, materialism. You, you speak of matter as if it is, you know, basically the same as Hegelian spirit. I mean, there's no, 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 no difference for, for Castoriadis between spirit and matter. I mean, you could call it spiritualism if you want. Uh, everything will be the same. You, you know, you refer to, uh, you know, matter in, in this way. Um, so he then proposes that, you know, if you really want a, a materialist dialectic properly, um, then you have to refuse to posit an absolute being, uh, whether a spirit or matter or in any sense a totality uh, of all possible determinations that must be um, rationally given. You have to eliminate closure of the system, you have to eliminate the idea of completion of the system, you have to seriously accept the idea that they are both the infinite and the indefinite. Well, um, for those of, uh, of us who, um, you know, are working mathematicians. This is this is familiar territory. I mean, this is uh, basically what mathematics provides. I mean, you have incompleteness theorems. The system is open. Um, there is no, you know, even theoretical uh, possibility of, of closing it. And so, um, knowing that, Castoriadis then proposes, and he raves against structuralism. This is, you know, this is a, this, this book contains uh, some pretty entertaining rants against uh, you know the philosophers of, of, of his time in Paris including most structuralists so in particular against structuralism which he accuses of murdering the object in other words murdering ontology um, he then proposes set theory as, as, a, as, a, as an ontology now those of you who have read Badiou uh, will uh, realize that there must be a connection except Badiou never mentions Castoriadis not once I mean I found one sort of tangential reference uh, in, a, in, a, in a text that has nothing to do with this. So that's interesting, but I'll refrain from that because that's written up in, in um, reading um, uh, Castoriadis after Badiou, Mathematics and Revolutionary Theory that, that, that Pere mentioned, so I'll, I'll stop there. Um, I'll, I'm just pointing it out as, a, as a, um, an important moment that somehow uh, should be included, I think, in um, in readings of, of Badiou, whether he likes it or not, or whether he actually read Castoriadis or not, or whether he would like to be <laughs> associated with him in any way. Um, but uh, the, the bigger point, uh, apart from that detail, is that um, there is a sort of, you know, um, we're already seeing a sort of imminent critique. I mean, pretty soon, uh, I mean, Derrida uh, appears um, on the list of, of the people who, who were contributors to Cahiers de Pranalyse, uh, but pretty soon he starts, uh, you know, um, going beyond structuralism, you know, starting this sort of motion of, 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 uh, of, uh, of post-structuralism. Um, so, uh, same with Badiou, he's, he's working on, on, you know, in different ways uh, uh, to, you know, incorporate some structural feature, but also uh, wants to incorporate the idea of an event, of something unpredictable. I mean, so there is, there is this 
um, critique of structure coming from structuralism itself. So I would like to uh, go back to mathematics a little bit because there is a sort of imminent critique of, uh, of structuralism and this comes from the person that I opened uh, the talk uh, uh, with his quote about basically mathematicians are interested in structure. So what Poincaré does, um, he says, um, well, let's look at the concept of identity as it is in geometry. And he goes back to Euclid and says, well, what, are the, what, what does it mean that two figures are equal? And he says, well, they're, they're equal when they can be superimposed. Okay, so to superimpose them, you have to displace one and make it coincide with the other. Uh, but then he says, okay, uh, but how must it be displaced? No doubt we should be told if we ask that question that it ought to be done without deforming it. In other words, I'm defining the, uh, I'm, I'm deriving the identity of this object chair from the possibility of moving it around, displacing it without deforming it until it sort of coincides with itself. It's very, very, I think this is very deep. Uh, for one thing, it says that the concept of object identity is derived as, you know, secondary to, to a difference. I mean, you're sort of saying this remains invariant under some kind of transformation. So identity immediately becomes, in some sense, um, um, a secondary concept to, 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 to difference. What is identical is what remains same under some change. Um, second important point is that it displaces now the, the, the whole notion of identity of, of objects, in this case particular geometry, uh, it displaces it to this structure. What is a structure? Structure of transformations. These would be called rigid motions, I guess, in this particular case, if you're talking about Euclidean geometry. But in other geometries, there would be other structures that, that would define identity of, of, of objects. And then he goes further, um, and he says, well, um, there's a vicious circle here. Uh, def definition defines nothing. It has no meaning to a, to a being living in a world in which there are only fluids. So in other words, inscribed in our logic of identity is already some presupposition, some bias uh, that says, well, we're really dealing with solid objects. Um, and then you have this group of transformations that define, uh, that defines the, you know, the identity of solid objects. I mean, you could pick a different group, uh, or I don't know, T1000 could, could pick a different <laughs> group. Um, but okay, so now the question becomes, okay, well, so there's some structure that, that, that determines the identity of these things. Um, well, what determines the identities of these structures? Okay, so now there is transformations among structures, these isomorphisms that we mentioned before. So now this displaces the, the concept of identity to yet another level, um, because now you could say, well, really, these things are uh, identical up to some you know, transformation. We can never really, uh, other than that, uh, derive uh, equivalence of structures. And then you could say, well, okay, so this equivalence itself, you know, uh, means that there is some higher transformation that gives it identity and so on and so on and so on. So you have this infinite regress of, of mathematical structures starting from, you know, a simple example of where when two objects are, are you know, uh, uh, the same. And indeed, this is where mathematics eventually went. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, it started off from from this, you know, not because of you know this particular remark by Poincaré, but historically, uh, this is how it sort of developed. I mean, you now have you know category theory and higher category theory, all these structures that that are sort of stratified uh, up there, and uh, the point of them is that you can never really get to absolute identity of things. I mean, they, there's always some some higher uh, structural thing that uh, you know um, relative to which you are you are calling in uh, something an identity. So. Um, if you take that view, and it's reasonable to sort of ask, well, okay, does this take us beyond, you know, the concept of structure in some sense? And there's a choice they have to make because that's really uh, a sort of decision that, that we can't sort of um, decide uh, rationally. So um, you could just keep piling up these structures. And this is in some sense what happens in Badiou's work. Uh, he starts with set theory. Then in his next major book, Logics of Worlds, he switches to this topos theory. 
but he refuses to, to take the full category theory. It's a choice that he makes. He could have done that. Um, um, anyway, that's an interesting question of why he chooses what he chooses. But there isn't really any, uh, any um, reason other than a kind of individual choice that you now arrest this, this, this infinite regress of, of possible structures that go there. But as soon as you arrest it, you have a problem. Because, um, well, then you're kind of either imposing this uh, omnipresent structure, in which case you're saying the world is structured in some way, and you have to answer the question, well, who structured it that way, or why is it structured that way? Is there some kind of intelligent design or, uh, or something like that? Um, or you have to admit that there is this something that is outside of structure. Um, and so there is something for Badiou, it's the event, it just sort of erupts into being, um, but other uh, options have been considered. Uh, so aleatory ma ma materialism, about to say, uh, is one of the options. So I will not talk about uh, Badiou and events today, uh, other than to say that typically a criticism of that is that, you know, event uh, is understood to be this ma macro uh, level uh, thing. I mean, it's, it's you know, you, you expect a revolution, you expect something, I mean, that's the event. You want, you want Paris 68. Uh, that's the kind of paradigm of, of the event. Event is not... Uh, you know, some uh, imperceptible change that uh, leads to, you know, a change of the logic of how you see the world. The event is this major event, right? Um, and, you know, people like uh, Ben Said, for example, will, will say, well, you know, that's just kind of a religion. I mean, you're just sort of waiting for, for this, uh, for the coming of this event. Uh, so, I mean, that's something to be discussed. But I, I will not go there today. Um, what I want is to talk about uh, Althusser's uh, materialism. So he starts from, from this um, concept of, of um, uh, the swerve. Uh, so uh, this presumably is, 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 is familiar, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. I mean, other than to say that, uh, so for, for Epicurus and, and, and uh, Lucretius, you know, there's these atoms falling in, in, in the void. They just follow these straight trajectories. And then somehow, we have no idea how, at, a, at an uncertain time and place, a swerve occurs. And then there is this collision of, of, of atoms. And somehow, the world is then created. Um, and so that raises all kinds of questions. Um, so here is Althusser's uh, description. And I love some of the, um, some of the uh, terminology he uses there. He says, well, this infinitesimal swerve or deviation that occurs no one knows uh, where or when, how it takes place, what causes it. Swerve from this vertical fall in the void uh, breaks the parallelism, so breaks this what appears to be structure of some sort. Uh, uh, in an almost negligible way at one point, and then it induces an encounter between two atoms. Um, and then, you know, this encounter as if in a sort of highway pileup, and I love this word, karambolage, uh, in, in Serbian and, and Croatian and Bosnian, it will be karambol, uh, <laughs> uh, which is, you know, a, a beautiful, beautiful <laughs> term to use this. And from this pileup, uh, the birth of the world. Okay, well, it's a, you know, interesting. And then he says, well, that's the origin of every world, and therefore all reality and all meaning is due to swerve. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll want to work with that metaphor uh, a bit later. Uh, so, uh, but, but let's just sort of say a couple of things about his discussion of the swerve of Klinemann. So he says, the world is an accomplished fact, and the accomplishment of this fact through swerve, uh, collision, pileup, is just a pure effect of contingency. There is nothing necessary about it. It's pure contingency. No determination of these elements can be assigned except working backwards from result to its becoming in its retroaction. So in other words, he is looking to solve the problem of this mechanical Marxism type uh, uh, thing. I mean, you, you know, there is something totally contingent that occurs, and then we observe these things, and then working backwards, say, well, this is due to the, you know, swerve or, or of, of some description. Uh, 
Um, okay, but um, you know, there's a bit of a problem. I mean, this is actually a very interesting uh, argument to follow because it self-contradicts you know, on every other page and it's totally not clear. You ask the question, okay, so these atoms are falling in the, in the void. I mean, they're parallel, so there's going to be some sort of structure in there. Is there a structure? Well, the answer is, well, no, there isn't. Structure occurs only after the swerve sort of makes structure. Uh, so swerve is in some sense uh, prior to any kind of structure, but but how can that be? Because I mean, swerve relative to what? I mean, there has to be <laughs> some kind of relation between you know what is parallel and not parallel. I mean, uh, so it's it's a, it's a complex and not particularly. Uh, I mean, it's fascinating, but not particularly well resolved uh, discussion of you know what what is this that that you know that, that he's talking about uh, and what is this is there structure to begin with or no? Um, his answer is well, you know, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It's it's quite confusing. There is a beautiful paper which I recommend, uh, not for the solution or proposal that he offers, uh, by the uh, late uh, uh, Wild uh, Zuchting who. Uh, is a Marxist uh, uh, philosopher from Australia. I think uh, he died probably 20 years ago, but he has this 68-page um, textual analysis of the Swerve argument in Althusser. What is his name? Uh, Val, uh, W-A-L, Zuchting. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the, the reference. Um, it's 68 pages of, of, of pure joy to read because you, you, you see somebody just wondering, okay, what are we talking about here? And then he reads this and reads that and you see him getting confused trying to make his way out. There's no great resolution or anything, but uh, it's, it's a lovely uh, read. Um, so um, basically from what I can see, um, um, Althusser's, uh, ultimately he starts talking about, you know, laws of tendencies and, you know, they're not really laws, but they're just tendencies and, you know, he sort of, it's a bit of a cop-out really. Uh, he says, in the end, in philosophy, you can only think, think through metaphor. Okay, I mean, that's great, I like that, but it doesn't really solve the problem. Um, so, let's uh, try to um, make this a little bit more scientific, you know, this business with swerve and uh, and all that. And let's try to do it in a, in a structuralist way by going back to to Bourbaki. So um, remember where we left it off back in in the beginning of the talk. I said Bourbaki says, um, well, all these structures that you know somehow, without us knowing how, somehow correspond to empirical reality, but we don't really know how that happens. And, you know, well, we don't do philosophy, so let's just uh, leave it to philosophers. You know, presumably, um, uh, they will solve the problem. But there is, there is bizarrely and very interestingly, something like uh, a reference to a swerve in all this avoidance of philosophy by Bourbaki. He or they managed to get into the whole problem that I was just uh, discussing. So here's what they say. Um, attempting to sort of get out of, of trying to explain why mathematics and these structures that they're, that they're doing are, 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 you know, in some sense relevant to the world. They say, well, there is an intimate connection between experimental phenomena and mathematical structures, but we're completely ignorant as to the underlying reasons. In other words, so now, not only we're not going to address the problem, we are going to say, well, actually, there is a problem, but we're completely ignorant, so Again, we won't address it. So there's, there's this, this uh, a fantastic equivocation there. Um, so then they talk about quantum physics. And why is quantum physics important is because it goes beyond the quote, elementary intuitions of geometry of space and, and so forth. So that's uh, uh, their example. And they say, well, um, okay, uh, uh, fantastic. I mean, we have this correspondence between reality and mathematical structures, but this goes beyond, beyond any kind of intuition. We could not have expected, I mean, there's no, there's no perceptional sort of a, um, a sense, sense in, in, in intuition that, that, that will, uh, you know, lead you to, to make conclusions that, that it, this is just theory that was then somehow experimentally confirmed. Uh, so it goes beyond any, any kind of predictability uh, a priori. And it turned out, they say, that this intimate connection of which we were asked to admire the harmonious inner necessity was nothing more than for 
fortuitous contact of two disciplines whose real connections are much more deeply hidden than could have been supposed a priori. So in other words, so now we're conceding, we have all these structures, we do this stuff, uh, we could not possibly a priori cons you know, uh, construct that there is a relation between some mathematical structures and quantum physics, um, and we can only observe it a priori, and you know, and, and then you know, there is this implicit accusation of, of philosophy, or perhaps uh, particularly uh, idealist philosophy, in some sense, that, that that well, philosophers would like us to think, or would like us to admire this harmonious inner necessity, but really, it is nothing more than fortuitous contact. It's basically contingent. Um, so it just so happens. Um, okay. Um, so they do introduce this kind of swerve. The swerve in this case, and I, 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 I would just uh, like to say this, that uh, I, I will switch to some metaphors at, at some point soon. Um, but the swerve here in, in the view of Bourbaki is something like this. I mean, you have these disciplinary atoms falling parallelly uh, without any contact, uh, and then a swerve occurs, you know, some kind of fortuit fortuitous contact between these theoretical atoms, in this case mathematics and, and, and physics, and then from this you know, completely contingent contact, some uh, form of world um, um, uh, begins to, to appear. Um, and I would, uh, you know, I really like that idea, I really like the idea of, of this um, as a metaphor of, of uh, uh, you know, the uh, Exchange between disciplines, the contact, the encounter between between you know disciplines that otherwise are you know just sort of existing in their parallel uh, worlds of the academic archipelago, um, you know somehow something good can happen. It doesn't have to happen. It's purely contingent, uh, but something good can happen between uh, you know in, in this encounter. Um, but we could do a little bit better than that. Uh, we could actually, uh, uh, if we're willing to take a little bit of a metaphor, uh, we can do a little bit better than than um, uh, than Althusser did in in his description of the of the swerve. So I'm going to talk about uh, this thing uh, uh, very briefly. Um, uh, it's called Anderson localization, and that's a very interesting thing. Um, it's a you know a thing in physics, but really it's math, as, as everything is, in particular physics. Uh, so, <laughs> so uh, technical definition of, of, of localization is is absence of a diffusion, absence of diffusion in disordered medium. So uh, let me let me just briefly try to uh, explain why this why this was exciting and in some sense controversial. I mean, so you have basically. Uh, on, on a quantum level, when you start to look at modeling, thing, you know, materials, uh, what you've got is um, um, essentially a, a, a rectangular lattice of some sort. I mean, so you just have this, you know, um, just imagine on the line it would be dot, 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 one, two, three, four, and then you have this in two dimensions or three dimensions, so it's a box, but it's not continuous. Um, so they're spaced out because, well, quantized. Um, and so, uh, uh, for for a while, and for for various uh, good reasons, it was believed that uh, if you let a particle sort of want, walk randomly uh, uh, around that you know structure, this pure sort of rectilinear, uh, rectangular structure, um, you know, then you're you're sort of eventually equally likely to find that particle anywhere in there. I mean, it's it just sort of diffuses. Um, uh, and then, um, and, and there's a good argument for that. Uh, Einstein himself gave that argument, and uh, you know, uh, it sort of held sway for a while. But you know, there were certain sort of assumptions in there uh, that were built in, and those assumptions don't have to obtain. And so, this American physicist Phil Anderson, uh, in 1950s, I guess 58 or something, uh, proposes this thesis that uh, if you now let these elements of your of your uh, uh, beautifully perfect crystal, you know, jiggle a little bit, you introduce some randomness uh, to them, um, so some kind of, you know, physicist say potential, but essentially it's some randomness that, uh, you know, doesn't really, 
um, you know, you spoil the perfection of it, then what happens is that your, you know, walking around particles are more likely to be found in one place than another. In other words, this, this random jiggling kind of bounces them around in a way that, that eventually could lead to, to localization. This is a huge thing in physics. I mean, Anderson, in fact, uh, got the Nobel Prize for this, and, you know, his paper from having been sort of this bizarre thing that appeared now became a, a sort of probably one of the most frequently cited papers in, in, in physics. And yet it took another 50 years for, for, for this to be demonstrated mathematically. But um, the point here, I mean, is not the technicalities. The point here is that, uh, that I'm trying to make is that, uh, are we dealing with the swerve here? I mean, this is the swerve. I mean, if you look at the, the definitions of the, of the swerve, you have these, you know, rectilinear perfect structures, and now somehow you, you throw in a little bit of uh, randomness, and they call it, you know, defect or dirt or impurity or, or whatever you want to call it, uh, um, and suddenly, you know, things uh, begin to localize. I mean, this is a hugely important thing in, in, in physics because if you start thinking about how matter forms, um, um, you, you don't have the right to say that, well, you know, I mean, suppose we have this big bang and things explode in, in various directions. If you have a preferred direction, you're essentially imposing structure of the universe. You are imposing structure of the universe. So there can't be any preferred direction. There can't be uh, um, anything that you can impose on that that will then explain why, why ultimately, you know, some planet forms. Um, really the only thing that you can do is, is say, well, you know, there's a little bit of randomness in there and, you know, things localize. Um, now it's, it's quite a leap to, to say that, but it, um, it seems to be the only option. And uh, certainly, demonstrably, it does happen in some materials. So these, these, these things have been experimentally confirmed. It's not, uh, uh, you know, it's not, you know, like we're, we're, we're dealing with a, you know, a complete metaphor here. What the metaphor is, is uh, where the metaphor is, is this uh, relation with Klinem and relation with Swerve. I mean, you, you have this encounter that, that you force by, by, by essentially introducing some uh, slanted path into, into your perfect world. Uh, you will introduce this little um, randomness and, you know, some, something happened that you know, doesn't really happen in, in the uh, condition of purity. And, um, you know, I don't really want to say much more about that metaphor except that I find it interesting um, and also that we need to handle metaphors with care, uh, particularly mathematical metaphors. And so just a, a, a another footnote or, or a tangent. Um, is one one other popular thing that that uh, that sort of caught the attention outside of you know particularly mathematical circles was uh, you know chaos theory, um, and uh, I had uh, um, I guess I had time on my hands or something, so I ended up reading uh, management literature on, on chaos theory, um, thriving on chaos and stuff like that. Uh, it was, uh, it's it's mind-boggling and and you know interesting and scary um, in, in in various ways. Um, so, but you know it really what they pick is like one metaphor out of out of like this vast field of, 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 of science. So they pick one thing and they say, well, this is this is what happens, and now we're gonna you know do that. Um, so um, there is some. Um, handle with care instruction coming with, with this metaphor, but I think still it, it connects very nicely. And I will also, uh, 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 from personal experience, um, want to issue another warning about this metaphor, Is uh, and, and this uh, explains partly why the, the title of the talk is TBA. Um, I really wanted to use the expression that that people in the you know in the field working in the mathematics of this uh, uh, use, which is that uh, you know before we were thinking in terms of pure crystals and and now there's this little randomness and localization phenomenon happening. So now uh, you know uh, over coffee with with my colleagues, it's uh, it's it's not uncommon to say that the world is a dirty crystal. Um, <laughs> And I thought that's that's kind of nice. It's uh, you know it's beautiful. And then, but you know, I have spent some time uh, issuing public statements on behalf of my faculty association. And one habit that comes from that is that you check, you Google stuff uh, before you use an expression. And here is the first top result 
on Dirty Crystal. So I resisted the temptation to uh, to uh, uh, attend the conference uh, partly because uh, you know it might appear on some web page and you know so <coughs> I would like to point out the, I would like to point out however that uh, uh, the wording of this is fantastic because it's the art of snapping it's not the craft it's not a skill it's not a science, it's the art of... Anyway, um, so, so now that I've brought it all the way down, let me try to bring it a little bit, a little bit back up. Uh, I mean, I mean the talk. No? Um, so uh, what's, the, what's the sort of a, 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 a higher note on which one might want to end? Uh, would be this. So thank you.